It's Friday, December 31st, and the time for your Bobby yesterday morning news update. The possibility of students returning to the classroom for face-to-face -face learning for the new school term hangs in the balance as health officials begin to battle the highly contagious Omicron variant of COVID-19. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Kenneth George, who on Thursday disclosed that the latest variant had been confirmed in Barbados, said health officials and representatives from the Ministry of Education were now engaged in talks regarding the safe reopening of schools, which is scheduled to start on January 10th. We are quietly talking with the Ministry of Education and I am not in a position to make a pronouncement on schools. What I will say at this time, and based on our numbers that are increasing, we have to be cautious, and that is how public health always moves. We have so many partners in this fight. We work with tourism, we work with education, we work with Royal Barbados Police Force, every agency you can think of. So we will continue to work with education. I know protocols have been developed, and these were pre omicron protocols. But certainly we may have to go back to the drawing board in some instances to get a better um, understanding of what are the risks associated with opening of schools in this environment. Opposition leader Bishop Joseph Arthur is unsure how his newly formed Alliance Party for Progress will run its campaign. He told the press conference yesterday he was awaiting guidance from the electoral department before the party could determine how the campaign process is to be managed in a COVID-19 environment. This is one of the sad things, you know. We, we, we have been talking about how we could possibly conduct a campaign in the context of this COVID thing. But this is one of the sad things. I repeat, I, I think it is absolutely callous. I think it is reckless. I think it is totally uncaring on the part of the prime minister and the government to call an election in the middle of a pandemic of this nature because the electoral department has not already, as far as I know, declared the context in which the circumstances in which this election will take place. Now the electoral department manages these things. We have the health ministry, which in this state of emergency has certain responsibility making sure that things are done in a certain way. We have a COVID monitoring unit. I have not heard from any of those as to how we are going to go about the conduct of an election. Now, obviously, it is not business as usual. Avali also raised concerns about whether people in isolation or quarantine due to COVID-19 would be given the opportunity to vote. When the electoral department, the supervisor of elections, nobody of that nature has been in a position to say to us, this is how elections will go down. We have people who are confined to their houses under quarantine because they have been exposed. Now do those people vote? Or do we deny them the privilege of a vote? Uh, has anybody taken any of these things into consideration? Solutions Barbados will be forming a coalition with three other undisclosed political parties to contest uh, the upcoming general election. That's according to the party's leader, Grenville Phillips. He made the disclosure while speaking to the media at the National Housing Corporation, where four Solution Barbados candidates paid their deposits in a bid to contest the January 19 general election. We are currently looking at a coalition. Um, so you will learn more about that um, tomorrow. So there will be a coalition of candidates. Party, sorry, a coalition of this parties. Is with the UPP and the. I wouldn't like to say at the moment. It will be a Solutions Barbados coalition of other parties. They uh, they uh, agree with our policies, and therefore that's why there's the coalition because they agree with them. You move forward on those policies. The important thing, though, is every constituency must have a chance. Every constituency, um, they must know what they're voting for. Um, this is, and we've heard it before. We've heard it before when persons cry wolf and say, this is the most important election. Um, this really is the most important election for Barbados. Uh, this one determines what happens in 2022. Former Transport Minister Michael Lashley has returned to elective politics in an attempt to take back the St. Philip North seat he lost in the 2018 general election. 
On a Thursday, Lashley confirmed that he would run again when he paid his deposit at the Treasury to go up against incumbent Dr. Sonia Brown in next month's poll. The Queen's Council said while he initially had no plans on returning to politics, supporters and several St. Philip North constituents had pleaded with him to give it another shot. Lashley, who said he was confident in his chances of retaking the seat, said he hoped to add to the efforts of preserving democracy in Barbados. There's regional and international news after this short break. Hi, my name is Christian Paul. I'm the country manager of BCIC here in Barbados. When the COVID vaccine first came out, I thought it was an interesting and a potentially successful way for us to navigate our way out of the pandemic and a return to some state of normalcy. I took the vaccine because I have a young family. I want to make sure that they are safe and protected. I have friends, extended family, and obviously I work here with colleagues, so I thought it was a good way to protect, to help protect them and to keep them safe, as well as myself. I would encourage others to take the vaccine because I know that you can still transmit the disease, even if you're vaccinated, but the chances of being severely ill or worse dying are significantly reduced. Let's roll up our sleeves and get back to living. To news from the region, the University of the West Indies Five Islands campus sets its sights on creating a partnership with MIT. More from ABS News. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, is on UE's radar. And so says Director of Academic Affairs at Five Islands, Dr. Curtis Charles. I have a meeting in um, early February. I'm going to be talking to my alma mater, MIT, about developing some relationship with the new School of Science, Computing and Artificial Intelligence, um, as well as the Sloan Business School and our business school. Um, we, early in those conversations, we have had one, two conversations so far, and we're going to have a follow-up one coming in, in, um, coming in February. According to the QS World University rankings for 2021, MIT is the number one ranked university worldwide, higher than Oxford, higher than Stanford, Cambridge, and Harvard. Dr. Charles says this is another step towards ensuring current and graduating students have options to gain knowledge and skills they can better leverage after graduation. So that's how we build capacity. That's how we give our students multiple path towards degree completion. Our students could still go to graduate schools anywhere in the region, but we also want to give them the opportunities to expand their horizon and basically learn more and learn a diversity of possibilities and a diversity of, of, of subjects and diversity of learning styles as well. On the international front, the Omicron variant has resulted in the rise of thousands of new COVID-19 hospitalizations among children in the United States. The details of that story in this report from Reuters TV. In just a few weeks, the Omicron variant has had an outsized impact on the youngest Americans. The average number of daily hospitalizations for children in the U.S. has soared nearly 60 percent in the final days of December, compared to about 19 percent for all age groups, raising concerns about how those under 18 and unvaccinated will fare in the new surge. Dr. James Schneider is chief of pediatric critical care at New York's Cohen Children's Medical Center. We're seeing record numbers of admissions of all children of all ages from newborns all the way through 21 years of age in, in hospitals and in ICUs with Omicron. Um, not to say that it's more uh, severe, but it's, uh, my, my experience so far is that it's not less severe, at least in kids. It's just that it's much more contagious. Even in New York City, which has some of the highest vaccination rates in the U.S., only around 40% of 5 to 17-year-olds are fully vaccinated, compared with more than 80% of adults, city health data shows. There is no authorized vaccine for U.S. children under the age of 5. That's news. But for the very latest, visit us at www.barbidestoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook, and sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media in bus terminals, as well as screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. And you can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.